हेलो सर हेलो या या यस हेलो यस शाल वी वेट फॉर अनदर फाइव मिनट तो पीपल वोंट मिस आउट द फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग ओके थैंक यू
Hello everyone. Uh, we will be starting by 3:40 p.m. only because uh, most of our audience are still joining the session, so they won't miss out uh, it from the beginning. Okay.
Hello, Dr. Siddharth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we should start now, or shall we wait for another five minutes or so? Okay, yeah, we'll wait till uh, we'll leave, uh, 3 45 minutes. Yeah, I think that is because people are still joining the group. In, so, yeah. okay, that would be fine. Uh, Dr. Siddharth, yes. shall we begin right now? Yeah, yeah, we'll start. Yes. I'll start with a brief introduction about you uh, to the audience, uh, then okay. you can take on the session. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Siddharthan is an associate professor, Department of Life Science, Christ University, Bangalore. He is current uh, today uh, presenting on the topic plant evolution, speciation, and diversification in plants and Indian story. And Dr. Siddharthan did his doctoral research from the University of Hong Kong. He worked at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Bangalore, as a postdoctoral fellow. Much of his research is focused on plant evolution, especially species evolution. He is well known for his plant taxonomy work as well.
Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're audible. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank all Kerala Research Scholars Association (KFRI) for inviting me to present a seminar on my research findings. Uh, in today's talk, I'll be talking about uh, speciation. So the agenda for today's talk is uh, on two topics about uh, endemic radiations and cryptic speciation in two different model systems which I have been working on. First, I'll give a brief outline of a basis of uh, speciation. So speciation is, uh, is a process which gives the entire biodiversity which we see today. So what is the species concept uh, was as early as in the 17th century, some botanists like uh, John Ray, uh, Linnaeus, they came with the species concept, concept. They defined species as something which is morphologically similar to each other. Later, the concept of reproductive isolation was also added by uh, Deke and another uh, botanist. So where they said that uh, similar looking organisms which can interbreed among themselves are species. But later came uh, Darwin, the, uh, the scientist who proposed the idea of evolution long before uh, the idea of uh, the genes were also uh, came into existence. So Darwin uh, view, I mean, when he traveled to different islands and different continents, he saw the amazing diversity there. He was coming from a, a temperate country uh, from England where the diversity is not that much. When he traveled to the tropical islands, he saw there's so many number of species and there's a lot of minor variations within these species. And we thought that uh, these are the process, I mean, uh, the process in which a new species is going to evolve. There are two different morphological varieties and there are intermediate varieties. He thought uh, a species is uh, in the process of evolving. So he considered species as a fundamental unit of evolution. He, he was the first to think about how speciation is happening rather than seeing species as already created entities. So uh, species uh, from a physical point of view evolved uh, by this uh, geographic isolation uh, and reproductive isolation and natural selection. I'll talk about these in the coming slides. From the genetic point of view, speciation occurs from the uh, random genetic drift, the normal mutations which are accumulating. And these mutations, if it gives an advantage in, uh, for natural selection, they become fixed in the population and that helps in uh, speciation. Apart from that, speciation can be accelerated by hybridization. I mean, hybridization, I mean, two uh, species carrying two different set of genes and evolving into new species. Also by polyploidy, doubling of the chromosome number, and also due to recombination after hybridization. So these are uh, uh, from the genetic point of view. So Darwin proposed this uh, theory of evolution in the 1850s. He was far ahead of his time. Later, the theory of uh, genetics came into existence. The, the, the discovery of the gene, the patterns, the inheritance came into uh, uh, came to our knowledge. Then, uh, several scientists like J.B.S. Haldane, uh, several Wright, uh, the population genetist, Dobzhansky, an evolutionary biologist, they proposed something called the modern synthesis. They saw evolution from a perspective of genetics. They included genetics in the picture of evolution and they proposed uh, ideas about gene flow and how uh, genetic material is exchanged between species and what causes the separation of the gene flow. And that uh, led to the idea of the modern synthesis. The basis of modern synthesis gave rise to the geographic models of speciation. So according to this geographic model, we have uh, three uh, models of uh, speciation, like allopatric, parapatric, and um, sympatric. So in the two ends of the spectrum is allopatric and sympatric. In allopatric, speciation is the most um, accepted geographical mode of speciation where uh, a species is, is inhabiting a wide range of uh, habitat. And suddenly these two uh, species are separated by a barrier, either a mountain or a river valley or some, uh, some geographical barrier separates them. And over a period of time, these two uh, populations are not able to interbreed among themselves. And due to this, they accumulate a lot of uh, mutations and these mutations start reflecting in their morphology as well. So the, uh, due to their morphological changes, they are not able to reproduce among themselves anymore. So they, they, the species uh, 
look different and also they are not able to interbreed among themselves. So this is a uh, gives rise to new species, to two new species from an ancestral species. This is a allopatric speciation where speciation occurs in two different geographic locations or two different places. And the intermediate form is a parapatric, uh, parapatric speciation. In parapatric speciation, uh, the land mass is not separated by a geographical barrier. It's relatively short land mass, but still a group of uh, uh, individuals from that species, say a population, enters into a specialized niche. Say, for example, uh, there is a mountain area where a special kind of uh, food is available for that species. It goes into that particular niche and starts living there. And slowly the gene flow between the rest of the population and this specialized population becomes separated. And that causes a new species to evolve within the same geographical location, even in the absence of any uh, barrier, any, any big geographical barrier. It means that uh, in general, this population can interbreed among themselves, but still due to ecological uh, adaptation, they, they enter into a new niche and form into a new species. And the third uh, model is a sympatric speciation where uh, species of the same, I mean, problems, individuals of the same species can uh, readily be uh, meeting each other. The gene flow is possible, but due to some uh, reason, say for example it accumulates a different kind of mutation or they, they adapt to a separate kind of uh, food a separate kind of uh, this this has been seen in um, insects feeding on two different uh, fruits so insects over a period of time living in the same uh, locality one insect feeding on a say for example an apple tree and another uh, eating on a pear tree generally over a period of time accumulate a lot of mutations genetic mutations and slowly in the, pro in the process of uh, evolutionary time, they evolve as two different species. So those, those these three models were proposed. Sympatry uh, is very rare to found, uh, rare to be found because uh, there are only few examples except uh, for some insects which evolve based on their food choices and which are living in the same locality. So uh, species, uh, radiation is nothing but the increase in the number of uh, species or uh, it's, it's nothing but speciation. Uh, Darwin uh, identified uh, this kind of variation, a lot of number of species in Galapagos Islands that he visited. Uh, in 1902, a uh, paleontologist uh, gave the name uh, adaptive radiation uh, to the sudden explosion of species in response to ecological niches or in their adaptation to their um, available ecosystems by developing uh, some key features. For example, these uh, Finches are nothing but this uh, uh, ground finches. They live on the ground. They, they are not on the trees. They, these uh, Darwin's finches are uh, ground finches called Geospisa. They specialize on different kinds of foods. A group of uh, insects, uh, which are primarily, I um, mean, group of birds uh, are primarily insectivores. So their beaks are uh, very pointed so that they can pick up the insects. And suddenly they, uh, within that population, a group of uh, uh, birds emerged which became uh, seed eaters and within seed eaters there was specialization into cactus eaters I mean, cactus uh, cactuses are generally soft uh, whereas the seeds are hard so that uh, birds eating seeds had very uh, strong uh, big beaks and some were leaf eaters so based on the availability of the food uh, several different populations several different species of uh, birds emerged so there are about, uh, this is a classic example of adaptive radiation uh, in any evolutionary textbook you might have come across. There are about 23 species of uh, finches. Uh, with later the genetic study also proved that uh, one ancestral bird, probably from the Ecuador, the, main, the closest uh, mainland from South America, um, by, by chance migrated into this uh, newly formed Galapagos Islands. And since they found a lot of varieties of foods and a lot of habitats, they were able to diversify in these new habitats and gave rise to multiple species. Apart from this, apart from Darwin's finches, there are several classical examples of uh, adaptive radiation. One of them is the African uh, Rift Valley uh, cichlids. So in these uh, African freshwater lakes, they are very, very large lakes. Uh, for example, in Lake Malawi itself, you find about 500 plus number of species. 
So these species are uh, uh, evolved due to the, uh, again, like uh, eating feeding habits. Some feed on uh, 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 algae on the rocks, some feed on other fishes, some feed on snails. So because of they have partitioned the food source, they are able to evolve. Though these uh, lakes are interconnected, even within these lakes, they form separate habitats where they evolve separately. And there's also a lot of uh, color variation in these fishes and which uh, and there was a lot of sexual selection uh, happening here, sexual uh, speciation happening here. And the other example is a classical example is the Caribbean uh, islands, anolis lizards. So the mo body morph of these uh, lizards are very much varied. The lizards growing on the top canopy, since they are covered by the leaves, they generally tend to evolve into a large body one, like the crown giants. Whereas the grassland ones uh, are having a very slender body so that they are not very uh, visible to the flying uh, predators like the uh, raptors. And also their uh, body size also is uh, modified to the uh, trunk or the plant part which they are growing in. For example, uh, this the insects which are growing on shrubs have very, very tiny body, very slender body, whereas the ones which are living on the trunks have a wider body. And also their arm sizes are also adapted to holding the substrate in which they are um, evolved into. So this is so this kind of adaptive radiation is very peculiar that the same kind of pattern is, uh, is has been uh, repeated in different separate islands individually, in, independently. Also the same pattern has been observed. This is a classical case of uh, anolis lizards. Another uh, example is from the Hawaiian honey creepers. These are very much similar to the Darwin finches. They are also from about, about 23 species. They are also specialists on feeding cactuses. Some feed on nectar, which their beaks are long and pointed so that they can enter into the uh, flower and collect nectar. Many are insectivores. They have uh, very attractive uh, uh, plumages also. So one species, okay, initially it was thought to be six different uh, lineages within these uh, finches and then within these uh, honey creeper birds. But later genetic study proved that uh, when these Hawaiian islands were formed, one of the birds from the mainland entered into this island. And since they found so many niches, they diversified into different kinds of uh, body forms because there are different kinds of foods available. And another uh, examples from plant is the Hawaiian lobelias. Again, uh, these plants uh, are these plants have around um, 24 species in uh, Hawaii. They are adapted to different kinds of uh, habitats like the bogs, mountain tops. Some are um, climbers. So since different kind of uh, habitats are available, uh, some you can see some of them are uh, tree types. Some are shrubs. So a lot of variation in the morphology but again they have also been traced to one migration event which comes from the mainland uh, probably from um, somewhere in the mainland uh, north america and a very classical example of uh, adaptive radiation in its plants is the uh, silver sword uh, alliance from hawaii so this plant called Archerocytium, uh, you see here it's called the silver sword plant it is it is found in the volcanic soil of uh, some, some of the Hawaiian islands. So this is a landmark plant of this uh, Hawaiian islands. So there are three genera called uh, Wilkesia, Debauchia, and uh, Argeocyphium. And uh, molecular analysis later showed that they came from uh, tar weeds. These are the Astraceae plants from uh, somewhere from the California. Uh, the common tar weeds from the California somehow through, through wind might have uh, reached uh, Hawaii and then it radiated into multitude of plants like trees. You can see the tree forms, rosette forming, shrub type, the silver sword, which is having a very big uh, inflorescence and also some climbing, uh, climbing forms, some epiphytic forms. So these are classic examples of uh, adaptive radiation where one species show a wide range of morphological variation. One ancestral species enters into a uh, habitat and since there are different uh, types of habitats, they, they adapt morphologically according to the ecological conditions there. So what is the characteristic of adaptive radiation? How can you differentiate adaptive radiation from uh, any other kind of radiation where there's no adaptation, adam, uh, adaptation to the environment? 
So Givnesh, who is an expert in uh, evolutionary uh, ad adaptive radiation, he gave certain criteria. So adaptive radiations uh, in general have increased in the range of ecological roles collectively uh, exhibited by the members. So uh, each of these um, uh, initial these species found in different habitats should have different ecological roles. For example, um, these birds, uh, finches had different food, like some uh, finches had which fed on insects, some fed on uh, seeds. So they should have a very wide range of ecological roles. And according to that, they should have a, a increase in the diversity of the traits. For example, the beak size uh, also varied according to their food type. And there should be a selective pressure in the divergence. That means these uh, 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 these species have selectively um, and they have a selective advantage in that environment. For example, these uh, insects with large beaks have a selection advantage that they can feed on uh, seeds with larger sizes. And they should have a range of uh, morphological variations. That's what they call uh, morphospace. You can see within the seed eaters there are. There is a small beak, medium size, large beak, and the intermediate beak. So within the seed eaters also, there is a there is a diversification within the beak sizes also, and that is the, that is called the morphospace. And uh, this morphospace space, uh, should not be increasing. So after a period, after all the uh, ecological spaces have been adapt, I mean reached, it has this diversification should reduce. That's that's one of the criteria. Then another important criteria is that uh, these species should live within a geographical distribution. That means these are parapatric, either uh, parapatric or sympatric, or these are classical examples of parapatric species. There is no any barrier to the gene flow. Uh, they are only partitioning the resources within the same ecosystem. And another feature is that there's a net uh, species diversification rate. That means that it should be an increase in the number of species within a short period of time. Say, for example, five or 10 million years. Uh, many number of species should be produced. And uh, Givnish mentions that this is not a defining character. That means there are uh, many, many cases where there is a speciation and there is no adaptation of any sort. So what is the modern idea of uh, radiation or increase in the species numbers? Uh, well known is adaptive radiation where there is a key innovation to go and adapt to that particular uh, environment. But in general, the uh, radiation is uh, driven by geographic uh, radiation, mean, geographic features, like for example, uh, different heights of the mountains or different uh, rivers separating these uh, different species can give rise to different kind of uh, speciations. Also, the similar thing is the climatic radiation. But there are some cases where there is actually no radiation. That means there's no increase in the number of species. Uh, that is called disparification. You may observe a lot of variation in the morphology. But they, this kind of variation is all among the uh, individuals of uh, the same populations. Uh, this might be due to the a uh, lot of morphological variations, which doesn't lead to speciation in some kinds. And there are some cases uh, which is called pseudo radiation, where uh, species is, uh, species speciation is an event. Uh, that means new species are born and the old species die. So this is a kind of balanced event. If this balance is gone. That means there are more number of, uh, uh, there is no extinctions and these ancestral species are still existing. That means they, they have they have been in a stasis for a long evolutionary time. So that is uh, pseudo radiation. So there are different uh, concepts nowadays to provide, to explain how this variation uh, occurs. So coming to uh, our model system, uh, see many of, I, I gave three examples of uh, adaptive radiation in Hawaii and they showed many plants uh, which have different uh, form just to adapt to the different uh, environmental conditions. When you see this map of India, though it is not exactly an island, uh, you can see on the map on the right hand side, it is bound by the sea on the peninsula region and on the Tibetan plateau on the northeastern side. On the western side, we have the desert. So India is uh, like a uh, uh, like an island where one species once entered cannot move back or there is no frequent uh, uh, influx of uh, new uh, biota into the India. Whatever is in India has to diversify within this land mass. And on the map on the left hand side, uh, I show an altitude map. So there is a wide range of altitudes also, which comes with different climates, different rainfalls. 
So these provides very unique habitats or very diverse habitats for these species to go and occupy and evolve. And uh, one uh, important uh, biodiversity hotspot is the Western Guards. Most of uh, most of us uh, must be working on Western Guards. So because it is, uh, it contains about 10% of the forests of India. And you can see in this image, the uh, forests of Western Guards are totally uh, diverse. So you have the Sholas here, where the, where the mountains with uh, grasslands, with patches of uh, uh, rainforests, and also a tropical rainforest kind of vegetation where there's a heavy rainfall. These are these are kind of uh, habitats found in the Western Ghats in the southern Western region, I mean southern Western Ghats region. When you go to the northern Western Ghats, the, the habitat totally changes. Though they belong to the same mountain chain, the habitat uh, becomes like plateau kind of vegetation where there are high elevation plateaus and mostly grasslands that there's no much of tree species there because the soil is very thin. Uh, this uh, iron containing lateritic soils, which host a wide uh, biodiversity of mainly this uh, herbaceous plants uh, uh, which don't have a very uh, big root system. So there's a lot of diversity even within the Western Guards. So Western Guards, uh, you know, this image shows here you have the Southern Western Guards, the Middle Western Guards and the Northern Western Guards. So uh, as I mentioned, there's a wide variety of uh, vegetation types from grasslands, moist deciduous forests, tropical dry deciduous forests, peat bogs, uh, semi evergreen forests, and lateritic rocky plateaus. So these are totally uh, different habitats which provide the opportunity of different uh, organisms to evolve. So I'll, I'll just brush up with the terminology of phylogeny. You might have studied in uh, in your uh, degree courses, but still, I'll just brush up with a few terms because many of the discussions are going to be in relation in relation to phylogeny. So, uh, the study of evolution is a study of uh, ancestral lineages. So it means what, what, how a species has evolved from an ancestral form. So, a diagram representing this kind of I mean, this kind of uh, evolution is that is the phylogenetic tree. So what are the parts of the phylogenetic tree? Like uh, a, a tree, you have the same uh, terminology. We have branches, we have uh, tips of the leaves, we have nodes, the, uh, points in which the branching happens, and the root. Root is the most ancestral species uh, from which all the um, uh, newer uh, taxa have evolved, or the younger taxa have evolved. On the leaves, you have the current present taxa. And these nodes represent uh, ancestral taxa where, um, which, which, which might have given rise to these new species. And these lines indicate the branches. Branches uh, show the relationship between the species. And also, it also shows uh, the time since these two species have been separated. For example, species A and B have been separated for a quite a long uh, period of time than uh, species C and D. Uh, when it comes to genetic, uh, in, uh, phylogenetic trees uh, can be made with uh, morphological data as well as uh, genetic data. Genetic data is nothing but we are going to use uh, DNA sequences to build uh, phylogenetic trees. So if there is a mutation which is shared among uh, species uh, C and D. So we are going to say that these two are more similar than a mutation which is not shared by this lineage A. So these branch lengths also branch lengths also indicate uh, the amount of mutations which separate the species when it is uh, a tree built using the DNA data, a variation in the DNA sequence. Um, phylogenetic trees have this uh, concept of clade. A clade uh, is nothing but a study or is nothing but a descendants from a common ancestor. So at, at node one, um, there was a common ancestor for uh, these species B, C, and D. And together, this is called a clade. And individual clades are nested within each other. That means uh, within a clade, the, if there is a speciation event or uh, evolution of two new species, uh, together they are called a clade. And the most closely related clades are called sister clades, whereas the distantly ones, uh, distant ones are called, um, they are distantly related uh, clades. 
So now I'll uh, introduce an important concept, which is the monophyletic uh, concept. So in this uh, putative uh, phylogenetic tree, imaginary phylogenetic tree, you find um, two nodes here, the green one and the red one, indicating as ancestral forms of uh, three species of this genus, uh, imaginary genus G. And uh, Y has uh, evolved from a, its own common ancestor. Together, these two lineages might have had another common ancestor here. Yeah. So that's why G is monophyletic. That means it has its own common ancestor and Y has its own common ancestor. Together, uh, they are, um, I mean, that means they are reciproc reciprocally monophyletic. That means they are coming from two different lineages. That means they are reciprocal monophyly. So this is what we observe uh, when building phylogenetic trees. We are looking for reciprocal monophyly, which indicates that a lineage is coming from one common ancestor. It's more likely that uh, one gene, genus Y had one uh, common ancestor, uh, a same common ancestor, which doesn't interfere with the ancestor of uh, the genus G. So there are conditions uh, called paraphyly and uh, polyphyly, which we observe in, when we uh, build uh, phylogenetic trees. Uh, in, in paraphyletic condition, one of the uh, species of the genus G is found nested within the clade of a genus Y. So that is kind of uh, paraphyly. And polyphyly is a condition where uh, the species of genus G and Y are interchanged among different clades. These are, these are uh, purely artificial conditions. Uh, phylogenetic concept doesn't allow this. We just look for only monophyly. If you obtain these kind of paraphyletic or polyphyletic conditions, that means our understanding of morphology is different. So if there is a tree built, uh, a tree which, uh, I mean, there is a, a morphological character which made the genus G to be present in the uh, branch of Y, that means that morphological character is, uh, doesn't, um, that morphological character looks like character G because it is a parallel evolution. That means the same morphological form has evolved in a lineage of Y. That is, that is the meaning of I mean, that's the actual meaning. So once you observe a tree, uh, after you build the tree like should be uh, like this one, like in the paraphyletic condition, the, the genus, uh, the species of G4 should be renamed into a, it should be subsumed into um, the genus Y. So that is the uh, prerequisite for uh, reciprocal monophyly. So these two are uh, artificial uh, or arbitrary uh, or you can call them as artifacts. When you observe them, you, you have to revisit the taxonomy or understanding of that group. A classic example is uh, this one, uh, the paraphyly between birds and reptiles. If we don't include birds in the, into the clade of reptiles, uh, they won't be monophyletic. So uh, it will be a paraphyletic condition. So that's why birds are now considered uh, as subsumed into the reptiles and that's a lineage within the reptiles. So to avoid paraphyly, birds are now placed under the lineage of reptiles, whereas mammals uh, are a different lineage. So uh, a, uh, birds are coming from a lineage um, which was uh, which had a common ancestor as reptiles. So reptiles gave rise to birds in other words. So to study this kind of speciation, we chose a study system. It is uh, the genus called Serapidia. You might, some of you might have uh, seen the plants. Uh, in the wild. The Serapidia is also called lantern flowers because of their lantern-like uh, appearance. They, they belong to the family Apothinaceae. Initially it was called Asclepiadaceae. Now again due to this paraphyletic condition, uh, Asclepiadaceae is now subsumed into Apothinaceae. So this is a tropical uh, genus. They are, uh, been, as such, the family Asclepiadaceae, Pieidoidae. Now Asclepiadaceae is a subfamily called Asclepiadoidae. It's called milk weeds. They produce uh, latex. So this is a phylogeny of the family. You can see uh, Asclepiadoidae nested within the lineage in Apocynaceae. There are five subfamilies in Apocynaceae: Rabulpiadoidae, Apocynoidae, Cicamonoidae, Periplocoidae, and Asclepiadoidae. Serapidae comes um, in this group, Asclepiadoidae, which itself is a very big family. So there are different representative. Uh, Flowers I've indicated in the okay. So Asclepiadoidea, you might have seen uh, from your uh, school books itself. You might, it, it is a, it's not a normal flower. Here you have a special structure called 
corona, which is formed by the fusion of the stamens and the stigma. There is no separate stamen, uh, separate uh, stamens and anthers here. Instead, the anthers are arranged into pollinia, special specialized structures. Uh, pollinia are nothing but uh, pollen bags, uh, which are uh, you can see the pollinia are found on the uh, gynostegium. Gynostegium is the style and the fusion of the corona here. And uh, gynostegium, uh, once the bird, when once the beetle or uh, insect which visits this flower for nectar, sits on this uh, gynostegium, the pollinia are rejected and they stick to the uh, leg of the plant, uh, leg of the insect, and then it facilitates cross pollination. So uh, that's one peculiarity of the milkweeds. The only other group that contains uh, pollinia are the um, orchids. So um, this is uh, the tribe to which the Serapegia belongs to. I'll skip this slide. The Serapegia has a diversity of about 200 species in the world. And it's the largest genus of the tribe. Um, Special characters they possess are they, they are uh, having lantern flowers. They look, the Serapigia looks like this. And the Sinapomorphies are, they have this tuber and the pollinia are uh, erect, not like pendant one in the previous, like in the previous image I showed. So this characterizes that tribe, Serapigia. And within that tribe, you have uh, around 250 species of Serapigia. The distribution of Serapigia is only world, old world. It means it's found only in uh, Africa and Asia. So it, in, uh, in extent, it ranges from the Spanish Canary Islands in the west to the northern tip of Australia in the east. So all these 250 species are uh, within this region, uh, main, mainly in the tropics. And you can see these uh, regions indicated by stars are uh, centers of diversity. That means more number of species are found here. And India is one of them. India has about 50 species of uh, Therapeutia. So I'll just show a few images of uh, this model system. Um, there are, as I mentioned, there are about 50 species in India and, and, and peninsular India would have at least 40 species. The rest of the 10 are in the Himalayan foothills and still uh, more species are yet to be discovered. So uh, these are the widespread species. They don't have any, uh, throughout the peninsular India, you find that there's no any restriction to any particular state or forest type. Um, Serapigia jansia, this is the one, the succulent one, the stem is succulent and it has very tiny succulent leaves. It grows on uh, thorny plants as a climber. Uh, Bulbosa is also kind of succulent. Interestingly, these two succulent kind of uh, plants are widespread within peninsula India. Hirsuta is another widespread form. It, it is found uh, all over India. In many states, you will find it. But there are the endemics. So Maharashtra's uh, state where at least there are about 20 endemic species. Only 20 uh, species of Therapeutia are found only in Maharashtra and nowhere else, especially in the mountain region, western grass regions, in the grasslands. So some of them are Role, Makkani, Sahya, Sayadrika. You see these white flowered plants. They are not very showy. They don't have the brown color. They are white or yellowish colored uh, flowers. So Huberi, Karulensis, these are all uh, kind of morphologically similar plants, again endemic to Maharashtra. So how are these uh, separated when morphologically they look similar? The classification is mainly based on the inner and outer corona. I mentioned the corona is a special structure, a crown-like structure formed because of the fusion of the uh, stamens and the uh, stigma. So this, uh, there are two worlds of uh, corona here, the length and the width of the Corona dis I mean, distinguish these species is one of the key characters which separates the species of Serapigia. So you can't identify Serapigia just by taking the flower and seeing from uh, superficial. You have to dissect the plant and see the corona, uh, the height of the inner corona and the outer corona. Again, uh, again, some more Maharashtra endemics. I'll show many of the end endemic species from Maharashtra. These are long, long peak plants. So called in a series called, I mean, Attenuate, Ananti, Attenuata, Anginerica, Mahavali, Jaini, Confinensis. These are all uh, found in uh, Maharashtra. Another group of Maharashtra endemics, Oculata, uh, Spiralis, uh, Fantastica, 
Vincifolia evansi. So you can see the variation in the leaf form also. You can see these are erect plants. These are not climbing uh, spiral. As you can see, they are uh, erect plants with linear grass-like leaves. Whereas Fantastica has very uh, normal, like uh, dicotinous leaf, not like a grass leaf. And many are climbers as well. So there's a lot of variation in the leaf also. Then we have again some more some of some of these Santa Pavi media or the Reta no Jahani, these are all Maharashtra endemics. There are almost 20 endemic species in Maharashtra. These can be considered as a northern western guard species. So coming to the southern western guards uh, from the states of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Kerala and Karnataka, we have uh, these species. Candelabrum is the type species. Uh, Linnaeus named the genus based on the species. And then we have this uh, intermedia, maculata, uh, twice seed. These must be found in the forests of uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Mostly wet adapted forests. Uh, the Maharashtra ones I showed are they, they have uh, tubers and that they are growing in these grasslands, high elevation grasslands. But these are growing in the uh, canopy cover also. They grow sometimes under the canopy cover. They are not growing under the open forest. Again, some uh, southern western grass species, Elegans, Manohari, Pimbrifera, Dacaisiana, Ciliata, these are all the western guards species. And now uh, we have eastern guards uh, species also. So the Serapigia pullei recently discovered. Uh, the plant is not very clearly seen, but you can see it's a climber climbing on the uh, very similar to the linear leaves. Uh, it's camouflaging the plant in the grasslands. This is a species found in the eastern guts, the eastern guts species. Again, the, there are few species from the north and northeast. So these I can I've joined the Himalayan foothills as well as the um, northeast states of India together, and these are the representative uh, species of uh, the north and northeast. Longifolia. Pubescens and Pukeri, which is a widespread species there, but there are some endemics within these states also, but uh, they're very difficult to spot. Them. And uh, another, I want to introduce another genus, uh, Brachistelma. Uh, why? Because they have, they occupy in, at least in the Maharashtra region, they occupy the same kind of uh, tropical, I mean, uh, same kind of elevated plateaus with the grasslands. You can see this uh, Brachistelma. Yes. Uh, orchids also have pollinia. No, orchids are monocots. These are dicots, totally different. So again, this is a classic example where uh, pollinia evolved independently. Since they are, they help in uh, cross pollination. They have in, these two plants have evolved them separately. Another advantage is they don't need to rely on wind. They have their own uh, vehicles using insects for pollination. That means they can produce less number of pollen and ensure cross pollination. So you can see Brachistelma. Um, the main difference between Brachistelma and Serapigia is that so far you've seen uh, Serapigia flowers, they are very long, waist shaped flowers, whereas Brachistelma are open type flowers. So this is kind of an intermediate, it has somewhat a waist like structure and it also has a long beak. So it's, it is, uh, tube is very short, maybe very, very short compared to the beak. So this is, uh, it also grows in the same uh, region. So you can say it, it grows in sympatry with uh, Serapigia. There are 14 species known from India. They are very rare, very rare because they are uh, very tiny plants and they grow only very few months during the monsoon season. They occur in grasslands and they also possess tubers. They are very, very big, uh, they, they have very big tubers. So these tubers are adaptations to dry conditions. So the, though these plants uh, emerge only during the monsoon season, the rest of the time they can be considered as annual plants living inside the soil. So only, only a, a short period of time they come up, say for example, a maximum of two months in a year they will be above soil. The rest of the time they are only as tubers. A typical, uh, these are the Eastern Guards uh, Brachistelmas recently discovered. You can see 2011, 2013 very beautiful uh, Bacchistelmas. So you can very uh, see these flowers like looking like starfish. Open flowers, whereas Serapigia are uh, base-like flowers. So we'll see in the phylogeny, what is the relationship between Bacchistelma and uh, Serapigia in the phylogenetic 
picture when I'm showing. So these are again newly described uh, Blackistel maps uh, from Uti region in Tamil Nadu, Mahajani, Bhattati. So uh, during my PhD project, I was interested in uh, this PCOs group because it's very hard to see so many species in one genus within a short geographical range. So for example, it's uh, Maharashtra itself has 25 species, so in state has 25 species. So I wanted to study its phylogeny and what is the origin of these species. So when I uh, built a phylogeny, it looked something like this in 2009. Uh, it was quite a uh, discovery because you can see uh, this this phylogenetic tree showed that Brachistel man, uh, Serapisia or polyphyletic. I don't know whether you can see the uh, names of the plants, but I can show this is the, the box indicated here is the Indian uh, species. Uh, th these uh, Indian species are a clade here. That means they are monophyletic from this point. They, are, they have a common ancestor from this point. Whereas the, and within the uh, Indian Serapisia, you have a Brachistelma nested within it. But if Brachistelma is a monophyletic genus, you have to, uh, this Brachistelma should be nested in another lineage here. Because you can see a, another group of Brachistelmas here in the African region. So clearly Brachistelma from India and Africa have two different origins. They are not coming from the same ancestors. They are two different lineages. Only the morphological form, the open type flower is kind of misleading us to call them as Brachistelma. More interestingly, uh, within this uh, phylogeny, you find another uh, group of plants called the Stepelias. This whole branch, this whole clade itself, when you expand it, if you add all the species, would be having around uh, 200 species in itself. So, so uh, Stapeliads um, are morphologically different groups. So you can see this is the Stapeliads again, the open flowers, and they are uh, the succulent types. The entire stem is succulent there. They are uh, uh, desert adapted plants. In India, they are represented by Carolomas and Bocerosias. Some of you might be knowing this in the in your field work. These are they're just looking like cacti. So together, Serapigia, Stepheliads, and Brachistelma, they are polyphyletic. That means they don't have one, I mean, they have a common ancestor from this point, when you can consider at this point. But taxonomically, they have been named as, they have been given different genera. So in a phylogenetic framework, you have to call everything, everything as one species, or you can individually name these uh, clades separately. For example, the African clade, uh, the African Serapigia should be given a different uh, taxonomic name. The Indian Serapidia should be given a different taxonomy. So either you can split it into smaller clades or you can combine into one clade. So that is what has happened here uh, based on the phylogenetic concept. All these Stapeliads, Serapidia, Brachistelma have been uh, published as one species. Now expanding the genus Serapidia into more than 700 species. So this is my first work which showed that uh, Serapigia and Brachistelma are polyphyletic and a lot of taxonomic uh, complications will come based on the phylogenetic tree. So in this tree, what was missing was uh, the, we had only the um, the sampling was mostly in the Western Ghats and we didn't uh, have more sampling from the Southern Western Ghats, I mean Northern Western Ghats, we didn't have more sampling from the Southern Western Ghats. And we wanted to uh, understand what is the biogeography of the Indian variation of, of uh, Therapygia. So I collected more uh, samples for the next project. So we used, uh, we wanted to know whether uh, these uh, lineages are coming from Africa. I mean, we know the center of diversity is in Africa and Arabia, where the dry conditions are more. The dry, the Arabian region also has a lot of uh, of these plants. So it's highly likely that, I mean, Africa itself might be having 200 species, India has 50 species. So the majority of the diversity is in Africa. Our hypothesis was that the ancestral uh, stock is from Africa and from Indi and, and how did it come to India, whether it has two lineages within the Indian, the Southeast Asian region. The Southeast Asian region is in connection with the Northeastern states of India. So the Northern India and the Northeast India are connected by forest to the Southeast Asian region. So the peninsular uh, Indian plants are different from the Northeast uh, region. So uh, we, we wanted to know what is the biogeography, whether it is uh, the, the Southeast and the Indian are two different uh, lineages, 
or whether uh, it, it came into India and then it uh, migrated in mean, peninsular India and then migrated into Southeast Asia, or whether it first um, um, like, um, dispersed into Southeast Asia and then came into India. These were the questions we wanted to ask. And apart from that, we wanted to know how many dispersals events are there in uh, India. Is that one dispersal event which gives to this uh, diversity of about 40 species? And what is, uh, we want to fine tune the relationship, I mean, the understanding of Brachystelma and uh, Brachystelma within the Indian Cerepedia by sampling more. In the previous study, there was very few sampling of uh, Brachystelmas. So our study was expand, ex, uh, expanded to more number of species, more number of genes, and we also wanted to date that. So this is what uh, the results we obtained. Um, we saw um, three different radiations of uh, Cerepedia into India. Uh, three different dispersals into India. Uh, one uh, indicated by these arrows here. I'm, I'm sure you, you cannot see them very clearly. So. Uh, this is one species called C. gensia and this is uh, one species called Bulbosa. These two widespread species I mentioned, right, the succulent types, they are not related to the rest of the 40 species which are found in India. So they had come later in, uh, from Africa, they, 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 are, they are a different dispersal event. Whereas the Indian species, uh, the 40 species are one dispersal into India and they gave rise to a long, uh, a huge radiation of species. They gave, about 40 species that uh, I have expanded the Indian uh, radiation here. So within the Indian radiation, you have several smaller clades. Uh, we have the Himalayan clade or the Northeast clade, the species from uh, probably with affinities to Southeast Asia and the Southern Western Ghats species like um, Candelabrum, Elegans, all these come out as a separate lineage. And the Northern Western Ghats species uh, form a separate plate, the Maharashtrian species form a separate plate. And within that, there are two different plates, two different uh, lineages. One lineage is more related to the Brachystelmas here. So, and um, and the Eastern Guards is also Eastern Guards species, which I mentioned, like Pullayi, uh, are, are a separate lineage there. So, within the Northern Western Guards, there are two entirely different lineages which are occupying the same uh, state or same, which are occurring in uh, sympatry. So I'll uh, zoom into the Brachystelma picture here. Brachystelma itself is not one lineage here. It has two lineages very clearly. We have the Eastern Guards Brachystelma are very, very different from the uh, Northern Western Guards Brachystelma. And uh, these are the Northern uh, Western Guards Brachystelma. And here you have one species from Myanmar nested within the uh, Indian Brachystelma. Here. So interestingly, the diversity of Brachystelma is very, very low in the Southeast Asian region. And there's only one species called Edulis, which has been reported, it's a type species. Uh, but later, several species have been found in India, but not in uh, Southeast Asia or this China region. I don't know what is the reason for that. Apart from this, there's only one more uh, species called Brachystelma keri from the Southeast Asian region. Probably, uh, these plants need more dry conditions and these dry habitats are present only in India and uh, only in India and such habitats probably might, might not be present in Southeast Asia. But I don't know what, what is the biological, uh, biogeographical history of this particular species in Myanmar. May, maybe is it a, a human mediated transfer? Uh, we don't know. We need more uh, evidence, more data on the species occurring there. And then we have the uh, uh, twining clade. I mean, within the Brachystelma, Brachystelma image I showed, they are all erect, erect species. And the separate uh, Eastern Guards lineage, which, which includes the Cerepigia pullei, uh, is related to the uh, twining clade. There are only three Brachystelmas in India. It's, it is unique to the whole world. Even there, there are no any climbing Brachystelmas in Africa also. So among the, I mean, um, this is a new uh, lineage, which is, the swining plants, probably they were ancestral Cerepedias, they became open flower types, so we call them as uh, Brachystelmas. You can see these three species from the uh, Eastern Gas region, they have this climbing uh, Brachystelma therefore. So the Eastern Gas Brachystelma and the um, Northern Western Gas Brachystelma, entire evolutionary history, entirely different evolutionary history. And within the 
uh, northern western curls also the the radiation of the there are two different radiations of cerebellum and when we dated the phylogenetic tree you see this uh, the cerebellum itself is having about 200 species we found that um this rapid radiation this this uh, increase of the number of species in the genus cerebellum started about uh, very recently in the miocene around 12.56 million years ago you can see they are very short branch lengths and they are um, this 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 I mean this the radiation itself is not very old that means this group is recently evolved not very old so this correlates with some facts in the uh, with this uh, with this physiological conditions these plants are uh, latex bearing plants and also they have uh, tubers which are widely adapted to dry I mean dry conditions these are kind of desert adapted plants so the opening up of the deserts only would have favored these plants so this uh, sahara desert is the recent um, feature in the african region so this has happened due to the uh, uplift of the tibetan plateau so since the tibetan plateau uh, is, is formed by the ramming of india into the asian plate this uh, you can you can clearly imagine there is asia and india is moving from the southern hemisphere and going into the asia once it goes inside this uh, there is a overlap of the tectonic plates and slowly the mountains start rising that's where the tibetan plateau is a very high uh, raised plateau so due when these plateau was raising it absorbed uh, it it has it uh, it started cooling up because of the high rise mountains and lot of moisture has been moving towards the tibetan plateau creating a, a dryness in the african region whatever the uh, wet uh, clouds are passing into the tibetan plateau that is one uh, hypothesis uh, which states that from the oligocene uh, there is there has been a dryness in the african the northern african region and uh, the sahara desert also formed by the uh, shrinking of the tethys sea the tethys sea is the sea separating africa from uh, europe and now the tethys sea is lost and because the sea is gone there's a uh, lack of moisture there and uh, the huge african landmass they couldn't get moisture from the sea that's why the central part of africa became became the sahara so these recent uh, climatic events started drying drying up the deserts uh, creating more desert conditions for these plants to evolve so because of these plants uh, could occupy this arabian peninsula and all the dry uh, parts of africa and since they get more uh, space to grow geographically they are expanding and they have they were trying to form new species so that is one hypothesis for the evolution of the entire uh, radiation of the cerebellum and when coming to india uh, this indian radiation is dated around 8.75 million years ago so this is closely related to the uh, climatic conditions uh, which was prevalent at that period so what what major feature was that again it is related to the upliftment upliftment of the tibetan plateau in the last 10 million years the himalayas uh, rose very high so you can say the himalayas are only 10 million years old so because of the indian plate joining with the um, asian plate this uh, tibetan plateau has been slowly rising and this uh, was date is has been dated to around 10 million years so this paper uh, zisheng et al uh, studied the uh, los plateau in uh, uh, in china so there is a gobi desert and a mongolian desert region right there is uh, on the yellow river uh, delta you find you might have heard about this los plateau los nothing but silt so there is a very dry area in china where there is a lot of silt there maybe maybe like maybe uh, several meters of silt is there so this study studied the different layers of the silt and they want and they could uh, study the formation of the silt dating back to 10 million years they found that uh, once the tibetan plateau was formed it trapped all the moisture whenever the monsoon rains build bring the clouds from the sea from the southern uh, seas like bay of bengal and the uh, indian ocean it takes it to the land mass during the summer period because the uh, land is hotter and the sea is cooler it, uh, the density of the air is less so that the clouds start moving towards the land and it goes uh, northwards it bringing rains that's a monsoon and once it reaches the tibetan plateau they can't cross the tibetan plateau because the climate is already cold there 
So all the moisture is trapped in the Tibetan plateau, and that led to a lot of dry silt in this Lowes plateau here. And that Lowes plateau shows signature of the uh, monsoon climate from 10 million years. And they saw a seasonality in the monsoons also. Like there was two kinds of monsoons: once in the one in the uh, northeast monsoon and the southwest monsoon. So these varied monsoons also started. The intensification of the monsoon started around the monsoon system itself started around 10 million years ago. And this northwest and the uh, southwest and the northeast monsoon became separated 3.6 million years ago. Only during this period, uh, this, there was a lot of opportunities for the Therapygia to diversify. These, as such, these plants are um, under underground. They are submerged in the soil. Only during the monsoon they emerge. And during that period, there are two different monsoons, so that two climatic conditions are provided. So the, providing them more uh, uh, range of speciation, more conditions to speciate. So uh, this monsoon has also supported diversification in many groups. Frogs, which are dependent on monsoons, have also seen a rise in the species, species numbers. I'll, I'll cite three examples of speciation based on uh, this group, uh, based on this monsoon. One of them is Sitana. Sitana was a, is a lizard, uh, ground dwelling lizard, which has this nice dewlap color. Initially, just before, less five years before, it was only one species in the whole of India, Sitana ponticetiana. Molecular work by my colleague in uh, Dr. Karan's lab, he found four different, I mean, at least four different species, four or five different species, and one different genus within Sitana itself. So better molecular sampling gave an understanding of the speciation in this group. And all this diversification you can see has happened during the onset of the monsoon. So you can see the number of uh, splits are happening more around 8 to 10 million years. So this is one evidence. There's also the rise uh, again from the lizards uh, from uh, Ishan, another colleague from uh, Dr. Karan's lab. So he also found out there is an increase in this rate of speciation in, uh, in another group of lizards called Opisops. So these, okay, these are examples in the uh, insect I mean, in, in the reptile world. What about plants? A recent study from uh, China in 2018 also proved there is a wide uh, amount of speciation in the uh, genus called Primulina. You can see the the map here. Oh, it is also this number of speciation has also happened around eight to ten million years. So in this paper, they suggest that these monsoon again the the role of monsoons in the speciation. So these plants are growing in the in Southeast Asia, you find these kind of sandstone mountains. They are calcium-containing mountains. And because the intensification of these mountains uh, led to this weathering of the rocks in the sandstones, so that they could they got more substrate. And that led to the diversification of the substrate for these plants to grow. And they think probably the, that uh, that could have affected the increase in the number of species in primal area. The same condition we observed in our uh, Therapy also probably in these lateritic plateaus, the monsoon rains have uh, created different climatic conditions: uh, early monsoon, pre uh, late monsoon, and also the weathering of the rocks might also happen, providing substrate more substrate for the plants to grow. So once new habitats are formed, plants are able to migrate into newer substrates, and from there they can evolve into new species because there's no gene flow between themselves. So I consider this might, this is not a kind of a, uh, adaptive radiation, it's kind of non-adaptive radiation, probably provided by geographical uh, conditions, geographical and climatic conditions. So this speciation is driven mainly by geographical and uh, ecological, I mean, geographical and climatic conditions is my current view on it. But still there's a lot to be done in this group. The resolution of the uh, trees can be improved. and. Uh, by, by taking more genetic data and also it's better to include more data. I'll talk about in the conclusion with the results. And as I mentioned earlier, there are four different dispersals into India. One dispersal which gave rise to the entire Indian field, I think. I think. Um, the other two dispersals are the Serapicia bulbosa and Serapicia gensia, two dispersals. And uh, there's also dispersals in the uh, another lineage, Capillary lineage here. It's shown, uh, it's not very clear, but I'm just mentioning there are three dispersals within the genus Serapitia and one dispersal in the Stapelia group, which is indicated by the arrow here. I'll slightly zoom into this uh, Indian radiation only. So the Indian the ancestral uh, 
area of the Indian radiation was probably somewhere in Africa when we made this ancestral area reconstruction using some uh, models. We modeled the ancestral area of the Indian radiation to be uh, at this point at B here. So that, um, that the ancestral population of uh, species from uh, Africa gave rise to uh, so many species in India because there are a wide variety of habitats which are uh, present in India and this happened in the last 10 million years and the maximum number of sequestration happened around uh, 3 to 4 million years where there's an intense intensification of the monsoon. The monsoons have played a clear role in a diversification of the species so that's what we can conclude from the present study. So as the conclusions of uh, the study about speciation of Serapigia is that uh, there are uh, Brachistelma and uh, Serapigia are polyphyletic and this has created a uh, taxonomic issue and now Brachist Serapigia is a genus with about 700 species because uh, because of this uh, lineages uh, when we are trying to uh, see the uh, common ancestor um, even though morphologically they are different under the poly, uh, phylogenetic tree they are uh, they could be clumped into one genus since uh, Serapigia is the first genus in this lineage, so it is it has been um, chosen as the genus name. So Brachistelma is now called Serapigia. And uh, with respect to India, there are three colonizations into uh, India. The two other species have not given rise to new species. They are still widespread, but they have not given rise to new species. There is one dispersal into India. Uh, into Asia and then that's the, that's the same ancestor for the uh, Southeast Asian radiation as well. Uh, Brachistelma has evolved um, twice in India as I mentioned, climbing form and the Northwestern Guards form is totally different. Even within India the true lineages of Brachistelma and the uh, diversification of uh, Serapigia, uh, the including Brachistelma has been driven by the intensification of the monsoon. That's what we could, uh, we interfered, I mean, we infer from the other study. So now uh, these some images I'm showing are from uh, China, this uh, China and Thailand, Southeast Asian region. So, so far it's been known that India is a hotspot for, one of the hotspots for biodiversity. Now, interestingly, this uh, new, new papers in 2017, 15, 14, at least 10 different species have been described in the last five years. So that means there's a high amount of diversity even within the uh, Serapigias in the Southeast Asia and uh, we don't know what is, I mean, probably the monsoons are also driving those things. It's better to do uh, I mean, phylogeny of these to understand the relationships. Uh, from from this current data, it is it seems to be they are also uh, related to uh, this one lineage from the uh, uh, migration from Africa into Asia. From there, they became two lineages, one into Southeast Asia and one went into the peninsula of India. So this must be the other radiation. We have to test this hypothesis with the Northeast species like Longifolia, um, Hukeri and all. So this is the area where uh, future research can be done. You can see the morphological differences. You can see the Southern Western the Spiralis and this species uh, from Thailand which has been recently discovered. They have this long twisted beak. Outwardly they look a lot, lot similar. The morphology is kind of overlapping and misleading. But these two species might have entirely different uh, biogeographical histories. So these questions can be answered when uh, more data is available on these uh, Southeast Asian species. So these are the uh, data for future work. I think I'll stop here. I think it's almost one hour and uh, I'll take questions here. Thank you, sir, uh, for your presentation. Uh, sir, we have, so far, we have only a question in yeah. Google Meet, and uh, we, were, we have been live streaming in Facebook and YouTube also. Uh, yeah. There's a question from uh, Sanel. Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship between high speed emptiness, high seed emptiness in plants and evolution? High seed and emptiness? Yeah, yeah. Relationship Hello. between? I see emptiness in plants and evolution. Uh, can you type what what high seed emptiness? I have not heard about. Uh, you mean the seed emptiness? Uh, yeah, yeah, seed I'm emptiness. 
Uh, no, uh, I, as of now, I don't know anything about uh, speed emptiness. And I mean, it might have evolved uh, due to some in some groups, and we have to understand in what group he's talking about, which genus or which family he's talking about. Yeah, we have uh, another question. Why do we have this much diversity for seropigia in Western Ghats? Yeah, that's a big question we are uh, trying to answer. As far as I know, as I mentioned in um, this slide, the last slide in the future, we have to uh, understand do this climatic niche modeling. Uh, that means we want to know whether there is a specialization of a group of species to a particular climatic niche. So climatic niche includes the altitude, the humidity, the rainfall pattern. So whether there is a partitioning of these species under in, the, in these climatic niches so that they can't disperse into other niches and they are becoming endemic to those niches. So we can clearly say this is a kind of climatic speciation. So there are a lot of different soils and climates within the Western Guards. So each of these plants go and adapt to that particular climatic condition. And then uh, that's why uh, since there is a wide variety of climatic conditions, there must be more species. That is what uh, I'm thinking as of now. But uh, more work is needed, like uh, we can do climatic niche modeling. But before that, we have to do a thorough study of the distribution. Sometimes we might think it is endemic to this particular region, but if you do an extensive field work, it might be another place also. So to get a clear picture, more field work is also needed. And also we can do uh, niche modeling to understand what are the specific requirements for that particular clade. And another thing is uh, probably there's a lot of hybridizations happening in this group which is also driving, uh, there's no, uh, completely no data on that. So we have to look whether uh, at, at the genomic level, we have to trace whether there is hybridizations and ploidy happening in this group. So uh, hybridization can drive speciation very fast. Two species can hybridize after a period of time, they can become new species. Hybridization combined with polyploidy can give rise to more species. So there's a lot of things to be done. The problem is these plants are very have a very short flowering time, only two months, and they are very difficult to spot. And doing field work will become very expensive uh, because you have to be there in the field most of the time and travel a lot of places. Sometimes it's very easy to miss, miss the flowering. One week you might miss the flowering, then you have to wait for the next year. As of now, I think climatic conditions are driving this within the Western Ghats. So that is the hypothesis. We need to test it further. By characterizing the climatic niches where these plants grow. As such, the, in genetic uh, precondition also, the lot of something is happening. That's why this uh, white flower form and the closed flower form, maybe they are controlled by a very simple mutation. That's why they are shifting from white I mean, open flower to the closed flower. And maybe there is some selection pressure in regard to pollinators also. But some papers which I've studied have shown that there's no specificity of uh, pollinating species, especially in uh, these open open flower types. At least the close, close flower type you have, uh, I mean, the size of the tube determines what species will go and pollinate it. But open type flowers can be easily pollinated, wide range of flowers. Latex yielding taxa, yes. We might, there might be a lot of uh, conditions. The flowering patterns might change as such. Since the, if the monsoon is becoming delayed or less, the pattern might change. Yes, definitely that will uh, impact the speciation and also habitat loss, uh, which will prevent gene flow. And as such, habitat loss also will, we might lose species just because the habitat is lost. But uh, this kind of climatic conditions will slowly change the genotype of the uh, organism, I think. But we might not be seeing it at a very short time scale, but it definitely will have a long, long, long term effect. Sir, uh, we have a two more questions. Yeah. Would it be that all right? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, mutation is. Uh, the raw material of evolution. Would yes. you please explain the statement with example in this group? 
Nirupam. A question from Nirupam. Okay. No, I was talking about the genetic drift. In general, the populations accumulate a lot of mutations, and these um, mutations, which are fixed in some populations because of their uh, separation within the because they cannot interbreed among themselves, these mutations, some mutations get accumulated with some populations, and these populations in turn become species. That that was what uh, in the context in the context of uh, modern synthesis I mentioned here. But here, uh, with this context, I am thinking that uh, the genes that control the uh, uh, open type flower and the closed type flower, that the shift between uh, the closed type flower and the open type flower might be controlled by one uh, transcription factor or something. Because uh, when we are studying about uh, floral evolution, we have a lot of transcription factors which control the formation of the petals and sepals, right? There might be some mutations which which can cause the shift between the uh, open type and the closed type. That's why we see multiple lineages within India within the Brachystelmas itself. Like Eastern Ghats has its own Brachystelma, the West Northern Western Ghats have their own uh, Brachystelma. Probably the shifts are happening uh, quite frequently, and we don't know what is driving the mutations. Uh, maybe they are spontaneous mutations or uh, mutations which are in response to some adaptation, we are not able to find as of now. Did I answer to your question? I was talking about, in general, the genetic drift, the random mutations which are happening, which gets fixed in the population and then it has enters into the species. Yeah, we hope so. You have answered that question. Uh, we have another question from Yadu Krishna Prem. But what will be your approach to identify the genes that control the open and vase-like flower? I would like to do um, from some transcriptomics because in the genomic era we can do some transcriptomics and see what is the, is there any uh, variation in the expression of the transcript, I mean, uh, transcription factor genes. We know some genes are involved in switching the or very much involved in the flower uh, petal formation, right? If there is any drastic pattern between the open flowers and the closed flowers, we can study using the modern transcriptomic method. That's one uh, approach which we can do. That that's the most uh, feasible approach, I would think. Milan has a question. According to flora questions in the 2020 species of species, how many more species are currently occurring now? Yeah, that flora presidency now many many additions are there. The Maharashtra work, uh, they have added so many new species probably in the last 20 years. So this 24 has become 40 now at least, mainly the northern western ones. Yeah, there might be uh, some extinctions also. Yeah. yeah then. Shall we move on to the next question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, is there any specific pollinators for this group? It's a question from Shahir. Yes, for when, with regard to Serapigia, there are uh, specific pollinators. There are specific group of uh, insects, uh, dipteran insects, which pollinate uh, Serapigia. There is a lot of the mimicry happening also. The, thing, the, the scent uh, emitted by the Serapigia flower is specific to that particular uh, that particular pollinator. So this kind of work has been done from the African point of view. In India, there's only one paper which is talking about uh, pollinators in this group, but only one work uh, from the southern Indian pollinators. And as such, pollination biology is very much lacking in India, and that's one area where we can do a lot of research. Yes, there is specificity in the pollinators in the uh, Serapigia of a lot of uh, studies happening in Africa. They have studied the chemicals emitted by the flowers and uh, how it attracts the insects and a lot of ecological work has been done from the African point of view, not in India. So anyone can take up that work also if you are interested. Because these plants have this typical vase shaped flowers, right? only a certain size of bee can enter into that particular flower. And once the bee enters, it traps the bee for uh, overnight, and the and the uh, flower tilts down. The next day only the bee will be released with the pollen to go to the next flower. There's a lot of uh, evolutionary interaction happening between pollinators and this group.
any other question sir that's all with the question okay i hope everyone's doubts are uh, cleared it was a wonderful session sir thank you and i it hope uh, it created a lot of interest in therapy jay if you have any interest on uh, this group you can contact me yeah, everyone is uh, i hope everyone is fine with the answer to their questions okay and we will get back uh, to you dr siddha soon with compliments for the talk okay okay thank uh, you everyone is, thank you for listening yeah this is the second talk to your summit shab webinar series uh, the upcoming uh, talk will be updated in our uh, youtube channel thank okay. you everyone for joining thank you